Voglio dare il benvenuti a tutti per essere qui questa sera. Eh, vi ringrazio soprattutto per la partecipazione. In questa occasione noi stiamo commemorando la giornata della memoria 2021 e abbiamo l'onore di avere con noi il professor uh, Solan, uh, che avremo il piacere di ascoltare, ma per iniziare voglio eh, salutare anche la Dante Alighieri del Massachusetts di Boston, um, in questa occasione eh, Luciana Bordi per uh, la nostra collaborazione. Luciana se vuoi salutare. Sì, un, il... giusto un minuto Daniela, volevo innanzitutto ringraziarti e ringraziare la, la Dante del Michigan. Abbiamo avuto questa collaborazione già da un po'. È, è una collaborazione che sta funzionando benissimo. So I want to thank you Daniela, I want to thank Chiara Durazzini di, della, della Dante del Massachusetts che si sta dando in quattro e anche in più, è piccolina ma comunque si dà in quattro per eh, far funzionare questa collaborazione. So I want to thank all the board members uh, of our Dante uh, of Massachusetts and we are all looking forward to listen to this very interesting session. Grazie Daniela. Ma certo, anche con noi voglio um, salutare il console Maria Manco di Detroit e Maria se anche tu puoi darci un saluto. Assolutamente, buonasera a tutti, buon pomeriggio, um, è veramente un piacere vedere tante persone connesse virtualmente per uh, questo evento uh, che appunto celebriamo per la giornata della memoria, il 7 gennaio scorso è stato uh, celebrato questo importante um, importante occasione non solo appunto in Italia ma anche eh, in tutto il mondo e così abbiamo fatto noi sia l'ambasciata che i consolati. Um, questo naturalmente è una, una celebrazione molto importante e, ed è fondamentale continuare a, uh, così, a, a ricordare appunto quanto è avvenuto proprio per non dimenticare. Io vorrei ringraziare la Dante Alighieri del Michigan e la Dante Alighieri del Massachusetts per l'organizzazione di questo evento che appunto vede anche riuniti i due consolati, il consolato di Detroit e il consolato generale di Boston. Eh, come dicevamo in apertura, eh, credo che una delle opportunità di questa crisi emergenziale, insomma, di questa pandemia globale sia proprio quello di poter organizzare questi eventi che ci vedono tutti insieme eh, e che ampliano così tanto anche la, così, la, il target, il, eh, il, come dire, il pubblico che ci può seguire. Quindi non voglio prendere altro tempo, ringrazio il professore eh, Levi Sullam che oggi è con noi, ringrazio Bettina che <ride> vedremo nel ruolo dell'intervistatrice e auguro a tutti voi un buon ascolto. Grazie. Grazie Maria, visto che eh, Giustamente portato, ha sottolineato l'importanza della collaborazione con Boston, abbiamo anche l'onore di avere il console di Boston, eh, il console Federico, se anche lei può darci eh, un saluto da Boston. Sì, eh, buonasera a tutti, eh, mi associo eh, a tutti i ringraziamenti e a, eh, ad essere davvero felice di questa collaborazione che, eh, come ha detto anche la collega Maria Manca, eh, nasce da una situazione di crisi. So I think this, uh, this crisis has helped us, uh, has pushed us to find uh, new ways of cooperating and this is a great opportunity to, to, to connect Michigan and Massachusetts through the two Dante Alighieri. Um, non voglio prendere altro tempo, eh, vorrei eh, solo sottolineare il tema eh, essenziale eh, della memoria eh, e citare eh, la testimonianza eh, di una persona eh, molto molto importante in Italia che è la senatrice Liliana Segre. Eh, Liliana Segre is an Italian Auschwitz survivor and she was nominated by Sergio Mattarella. Uh, she was appointed senator for life. Um, Davanti al Parlamento europeo eh, l'anno scorso il senatore Segre, la senatrice Segre, ehm, ha eh, pronunciato queste parole che vi vorrei eh, leggere. 
perché eh, credo che siano davvero eh, emblematiche dell'importanza della memoria eh, per la nostra società, per i nostri figli e per le future generazioni. So, Senator Liliana Segre, in front of the European Parliament, stated, I remember a little girl from Teresin who drew a yellow butterfly that flies over the barbed wire. May the yellow butterflies always fly over the barbed wire. This is a very simple message from a grandmother that I would like to leave for my future ideal grandchildren, that they can make the choice. And with their responsibility and their conscience, be always that yellow butterflies that flies over the barbed wire. E con questo eh, ripasso a voi la parola, l'importanza per tutti noi che la memoria sia questa farfalla gialla che continui a volare per noi e le generazioni future. Grazie. Grazie, grazie, bellissimo, veramente molto, molto toccante. Um, con noi abbiamo anche da Boston um, il professor Axel Nuovo, so che è um, tra gli ospiti questa sera, quindi vorrei un saluto, vorrei porgere un saluto a lui a tutti i nostri amici e i nostri soci. Prima veramente di iniziare, è importante se per favore rimanete mh, in mute e eh, se avete delle domande, per favore di scriverle nella chat perché avremo eh, il piacere di, di ascoltare le vostre domande. Magari Bettina le leggerà e farà in modo di porle al professore affinché possa rispondervi. Um, un ultimo grazie a Lia Delfi, presidente della Dante Alighieri del Michigan e um, grazie millissime a Bettina uh, Schlossberg che è il nostro vicepresidente, la quale ha fatto la meravigliosa proposta di avere il professor Sulam con noi. E ovviamente grazie al professore di aver accettato il nostro invito. Basta, non dico più niente, um, lascio la parola a Bettina. Grazie ancora. Grazie Daniela. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, I'm Bettina Schlossberg. I'm the vice president of Dante Michigan. I'm very nervous and really honored to present Professor Levi Sulam. I contacted him a year ago, a little bit before, I guess, in 2019 to invite him for 2021 to come, kind of wishful thinking, to Michigan to give a presentation. And he was not, he couldn't do it because of his uh, teaching commitments. And so I was really disappointed and sad. And then all chaos broke loose and we had the pandemic and as a silver lining, i contacted Professor Levi Sulam again and said, well, actually you don't need to come. We could have all the, um, we could have the, um, the presentation on Zoom. And he's like, oh yes. So here we are and um, I, I'm really excited and very happy that we can um, do it and that we have so many people interested in this topic and I loved the the yellow uh, butterfly flying over the fence because we all need to fly and we all need to be together and equal and uh, all those ideals make us stronger and happier so I, I'm really really moved by this. Let me introduce you. So uh, Simon Levi Sulam is a specialist in modern Italian history, in Jewish history, and in the history of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. And he um, devoted his studies to understanding the role Italians played in the genocide of Jews in Italy and how Italians participated and contributed to the isolation, dehumanization, and deportation of Jews of Italy. Italian and non-Italian Jews in Italy during the Second World War. Uh, he is Associate Professor of Modern History at Ca' Foscari in Venice. He studied in Italy, France, and the United States. He studied at UCLA, was a fellow at Columbia, at, um, at Andrew Mellon um, Postdoctoral Fellow and Lecturer at California Berkeley, Max Weber Postdoctoral Fellow at the Universe, um, European Institute in Fiesole. Humongous background and extremely interesting um, 
just not to bore you with with this that you can find online let's go to what you cannot find online and uh welcome simon um let me see where you are i can't see your picture oh there you are hello my first question simon is or to start with would be how come how come the situation could get to the point of turning neighbors against neighbors and friends against friends. But before getting into that, I would like to hear, why did you decide on this research? So on researching this topic from, from the point of view that you decided to do, looking for how was that the Italians participated in, in, this, uh, in their actions against the Jews? Yes, well, first of all, uh, good afternoon. I speak to you from Venice, Italy, and it's a pleasure and privilege to be able to join you on this occasion. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Bettina Schlossberg and her friends and colleagues uh, uh, at the Dante Alighieri societies that have invited me. And of course, I'm honored by the presence of the uh, Italian authorities, uh, Council uh, Sereni and Manca. And a pleasure to see such a great audience, including some friends and even relatives that I have in the US. Um, the, uh, the answers I will provide are based uh, um, on my research, my work, and essentially on the volume I published uh, in uh, 2015 in Italy, and which came out uh, two years ago in the US uh, with Princeton University Press uh, called the Italian Executioners, uh, the Genocide of the Jews of Italy. And I'm pleased to say that it just uh, recently came out in paperback in the US. Um, and uh, the reason why I decided to, wrote, to write this book, uh, uh, there are several reasons I've been working on uh, fascism and the Holocaust uh, and uh, Italian history in the 19th and 20th century for several years now. Uh, and I have always been fascinated by the study of fascism in Italy, uh, trying to set it in a broader European context. Uh, but I have also been concerned that there is a, a little talk uh, uh, in especially international historiography and certainly in the public opinion, uh, both in Italy and uh, abroad, uh, of the criminal nature of fascism, which today is still uh, underplayed, especially in comparison to Nazism. Um, but uh, when I talk of, its criminal, of the criminal nature of fascism, I am not only referring to the uh, racial laws, uh, the anti-Semitic turn of uh, 1938 and the later developments uh, during the Second World War with uh, uh, the, uh, the introduction in Italy of the final solution under German occupation and with the establishment uh, uh, in the center north of the so-called Republic of Salo. But I am talking more broadly of the fact that uh, fascism was one of the major uh, anti-democratic uh, experiences in Europe uh, between the two world wars and in a sense uh, Italy uh, unfortunately taught fascism to the rest of Europe, uh, uh, which uh, fascism, which was not only anti-democratic, but violence, intrinsically violence uh, since its beginning with uh, the so-called squadrismo, the violent action of paramil uh, paramilitary squads uh, uh, in the uh, aftermath of, first, of the First World War. And Italian historiography has increasingly shown that Already the 1922 uh, seizure of power was a violent moment, uh, that the March on Rome was not a, a carnival parade, but a, a, a breach of the liberal order. And that, of course, uh, as most of you probably know, uh, a full-blown uh, dictatorship was established uh, since the mid-20s, uh, around 1925, after the uh, uh, kidnapping and killing of the socialist uh, member of parliament, Matteotti. Uh, but I won't uh, go into a, a brief history of fascism here, of course. Uh, certainly, what we can say is that uh, by the 
late 20s, uh, uh, Italy was a full, uh, fully established uh, dictatorship, a, some say, totalitarian regime with no uh, liberty, freedom of opinion, uh, no uh, political uh, debate allowed, uh, and uh, the active persecution of political opponents. Uh, and later, uh, uh, the Italian state will also uh, um, reinforce its action in the colonies, uh, conquer Ethiopia in 1935, uh, and establish also there a, uh, a policy of racism. And in fact, historians are increasingly looking at the fact that there are connections between uh, uh, racial policies uh, in the colonies, uh, also in the Italian case, uh, and the anti-Semitic uh, uh, the turn uh, of 1938, uh, which also happened uh, in, uh, through, because of the alliance uh, with the German Nazism. Um, although the most recent historiography has insisted, and we can return on this later or in your question, on the relative uh, autonomy and even independence with which Italy decided to enter uh, the path of antisemitism and state racism. Uh, there, was no, there, are, there are no documents showing uh, uh, not even, uh, not only uh, orders by the Germans, uh, but even any kind of uh, uh, official or formal or even informal pressure on Italian authorities uh, to establish uh, and introduce uh, anti-Semitism. Of course, anti-Semitism was not a, 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 an ideological element at the core of uh, Italian fascism, uh, as, it has, as it had been uh, with Nazism. There, were, there was anti-Semitism within fascism in the 20s, but it was in more sort of peripheral fringes and it was certainly not central to fascist ideology at the beginning. And in fact, there was also a large Jewish support of fascism before 38, because uh, Jews perceived fascism as a continuation of the patriotic movement, uh, the Risorgimento, the movement for unification, which have, had given the, Jew, the, Italian, the small Italian Jewish community, freedom, emancipation, and uh, the, uh, had granted their entry within Italian society to the point that uh, by 1911, uh, Italy had its first and only Jewish prime minister, Luigi Luzzatti. Um, but to come, uh, but, but uh, of course, uh, what I wanted to do in this book, uh, more specifically, was to look at the uh, the policies uh, uh, which uh, uh, were adopted by Mussolini and his uh, uh, and his uh, mm, well the, 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 the fascist leadership uh, in the at the center of the in the middle of the war uh, after the establishment of the Salo Republic uh, under German occupation with the decision to enforce also in Italy in connection and in conjunction with the Germans of the final solution. Uh, what I looked at in this book was uh, what I wrote, wanted to write, what I wanted to write was a history sort of an everyday uh, life under the Republic of Salo and uh, a day by day uh, history of what happened in several Italian cities and even smaller centers during uh, the final, the Holocaust in Italy and to highlight especially the role of Italians in the arrest and deportation of the Jews. Uh, this was done uh, chief in, in uh, half of the cases, 50% uh, of the arrests of Jews in Italy was done by Italian uh, authorities, Italian police and carabinieri with so, the help of voluntary of the fascist party. I, whoops, sorry. Can I, can I interrupt? So how, how did it all start before getting to 43 there was like it it funneled so there was the the general normal let's say let's put it like normal anti-semitic feeling in, in the general population that had gone for centuries but then it started kind of affecting the life of jews in in more dramatic ways let's say in 38 so yes yes well, as, as I was mentioning uh, briefly, uh, the, the turn of events uh, began uh, very clearly in the summer of 1938, when the uh, so-called uh, Manifesto della Razza or Manifesto degli Scienziati Razzisti, the, 
manifesto by the racist uh, scientist uh, was published in Italian newspapers, uh, uh, which was a statement by a number of uh, Italian academics, uh, mainly scientists, uh, who uh, affirmed for the first time or affirmed officially in a, an organic way, in a, in a systematic way, the existence of an Italian race and its superiority among uh, races, uh, and among the races uh, in the Mediterranean. And the, uh, the also affirmed the fact that the Jews uh, and the uh, Africans belong to an inferior race. This uh, uh, was the starting point. It was, of course, a uh, statement uh, which was uh, politically uh, crafted and uh, decided and start initiated the series of events uh, which will uh, uh, which consisted in a uh, ra racist uh, census uh, to, which uh, was meant to establish the size of the Jewish population in which all Italians were asked uh, to uh, state whether they were they belonged or did not belong to the uh, anti of the to the Jewish race uh, according to the terminology of the time and this was based on a number of uh, uh, elements uh, in one's own uh, fa family uh, uh, ascendants uh, and uh, after that since the fall of 38 uh, after the regime had so to speak measured the, the size and ident the size of the Jewish community and identified the Jews uh, with the uh, detail with the detailed census, uh, uh, the racial laws were enforced, uh, first uh, hitting the schools, uh, the uh, educational system, that means uh, uh, um, uh, kicking out of the schools uh, and universities uh, uh, teachers, uh, then uh, um, uh, eliminating from schools students, uh, and um, uh, limiting the, ex the, ex the professional activities of Jews, the economic activities, financial activities, uh, and creating a de facto situation of apartheid in the Italian society, which included uh, not allowing Jews to enter uh, public libraries, excluding the consultation of uh, books by Jewish authors uh, in Jewish libraries, uh, creating uh, separate sections of uh, beaches uh, on the sea, and so isolating the Italian uh, the Jewish population, uh, which had been part uh, for uh, 2,000 years, uh, of uh, had lived for 2,000 years uh, through obviously different phases, uh, the Italian peninsula. Um, so the community which counted at the time approximately was a small group, 40,000 uh, group, uh, 40,000 people on a population of uh, 40 million uh, uh, was, uh, became sort of the, uh, from uh, night to day, from I mean overnight, a uh, the inter the new internal enemy of fascism, uh, in a sense uh, uh, substituting the the previous political enemy, which had been usually the the, the socialist, the communist, uh, and and etc. And, and this came also with a, a fierce. Uh, uh, anti-Semitic uh, propaganda in newspapers, schools, uh, etc. And so, if we if we go back to our uh, our main question, how come? Um, and I, you started mentioning this, and I, I interrupted you before. So, my question is, why and how did the locals collaborate? with with the authorities to so how did the locals contribute to this uh denunciation expropriation and deportation so it it, it went through periods first the denunciation then the expropriations then the denunciations uh, throughout the times but it was oh, probably the same people or the same motives all over uh making the locals act that way right Yes, well, so we're now talking again more specifically of the period of the Holocaust. Uh, so since the fall of 1943, it was at the end of November, early December 43, that uh, the Holocaust, well, the, the Italian uh, phase and the Italian role in the Holocaust began, although uh, the Germans had been active uh, uh, in the Jewish deportations uh, since the fall. It is 
perhaps one of the most infamous episodes uh, was uh, uh, October 16, 1943 in Rome with the rounding of the, uh, of the Jews of Rome in the ghetto, but throughout the capital, really. It was not the only episode in Rome, but it was a, a very uh, a, a large and extremely violent uh, uh, episode in which almost 2,000 Jews were arrested by Germans with Italian collaboration, which is usually underplayed. Uh, but to come to the role of what you call the locals, uh, this has been one of my interests. And of course, my work uh, follows on the traces of uh, other scholars who have uh, written wonderful work on, uh, on Italian anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish persecution. And some of it is available also in English. For example, the work by Michele Sarfatti, uh, uh, Mussolini and the Jews, uh, but also the classic work uh, by Renzo De Felice, which was written in the 60s and updated uh, in further editions. However, I was interested especially in the role of ordina ordinary Italians and the Holocaust, in a sense, uh, following on the path of work done on the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, especially the book by Christopher Browning, Ordinary Men, which looked at the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. Uh, of course, that was a much more violent uh, situation, uh, while the role of Italians was not that of killers, because Italians did not kill Jews on the Italian soil. Elsewhere, they did kill. For example, in the Balkans, uh, they uh, set on fire uh, villages and in the so-called anti-partisan warfare uh, uh, in, in the occupied Balkans in, in the first early 40s, uh, uh, they were extremely violent and, <laughs> and killed, as in every war, with extreme violence. Uh, uh, but the Italian phase was, uh, the Italian role was that of uh, uh, policing, arresting, and the de depredation, deportation. This was done uh, by the support and with the support of ordinary Italian in the sense that, as it has been shown for the Holocaust in general, the Holocaust had to um, base itself or was based and was conceived uh, as a machinery of destruction in which uh, bureaucracy had uh, a um, a, a very important role, an essential role, as uh, uh, Raoul Hilberg and uh, Zygmunt Bauman, uh, among others, have shown, meaning you needed uh, thousands of people uh, in the bureaucratic procedures, uh, and this happened in Italy as well. Uh, for example, dra drafting the list of people to be arrested, um, drafting list of the lists of their confiscated property, driving the trucks or the trains that led arrested Jews uh, to uh, transit camps and later to concentration and extermination camps. Uh, there were uh, translators working between Italian uh, interpreters, between Italians and Germans, uh, and there were informants, uh, ordinary Italians who uh, uh, betrayed uh, their Jewish neighbors, uh, sometimes their Jewish partners in their enterprises to seize their wealth uh, to uh, resolve a uh, Mauritian conflict, uh, or even because uh, they were uh, remunerated, they were paid to uh, denounce uh, their Jewish neighbors. Uh, so um, this is, however, the context, a more complex context, in which antisemitism was not necessarily a driving force uh, for many. Uh, it was also the context of the so-called Italian Civil War, meaning the period between 43 and 45 uh, was a period of clash between fascist and anti-fascist, the, the anti-fascist resistance, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fascist who had rallied with Mussolini uh, again uh, in the fall of 43, and of course uh, the German uh, and Nazi occupant. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, was a uh, violent and bloody season for the Italian peninsula, especially in the center north, uh, in which uh, the uh, kind of uh, frater, uh, uh, internal strife, internal war, civil war uh, broke out, uh, and there was a strong suspicions among Italians uh, that your next door neighbor was uh, uh, indeed your enemy. Uh, usually your political enemy, in the case of the Jew, the political and, uh, in a sense, racial enemy, uh, because the documents of the Salo Republic declared the Jew not only simply inferior, but a national enemy.
So, so what happened to, to these people? We said that um, the locals were like stepping stones to the machinery, translators or, or um, um, bureaucrats. Told, yeah, bureaucrats, or they told uh, who, or like spies, or told who was a Jew, who was not actually the list of, Jew, of uh, Jewish uh, people in the different towns was already established by that time in the 40s. Because in the 30s, there was a census, as you had said before. So um, there were some um, telling of who was hiding where or how to find people. Um, and or who wanted also a big part of it was were the, the, the people who were posted in the bo northern borders, mainly with Switzerland, just to get the double commission of the fee right. to help get to the other side, plus the fee of turning in uh, one of the Jews uh, fleeing, right? Yes. Well, what happened was that uh, at the end, as I was saying, of November, uh, the last day of November 43, there was a general uh, uh, police order for the arrest of Jews and police forces, uh, the Italian police, uh, the military police, the Carabinieri and other uh, police forces, uh, including, for example, uh, the financial police, uh, Guardia di Finanza, but also voluntary from the fascist party, uh, with the list of Jews uh, of every uh, city or town uh, went door by door to uh, seek uh, and arrest Jews uh, and uh, of any of all ages uh, hunted for Jews of all ages families with children uh, when they found them arrested them uh, they moved them to uh, temporary uh, sites of arrest so whether prisons or transit camps uh, uh, often prisons, uh, or uh, they were uh, uh, buildings which were used uh, uh, for uh, as, a, as a prison, in a sense. Uh, and uh, after a few weeks, uh, they normally would be moved to a major uh, transit camp, whether in the province or especially the, major, the largest one was uh, at Fossoli near Modena in central Italy. And Fossoli was the camp where, for example, uh, the transit camp where, for example, Primo Levi uh, went through after he had been arrested in uh, Piedmont. Uh, and this camp was a transit camp ran by Italians at the time. And by the midwinter of 44, uh, uh, the Italian Jew, no, the, 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 the prisoners were uh, turned to the uh, German authorities. And from there, they were shipped by train, cattle train, to uh, mostly the uh, extermination camp of Auschwitz in Poland. Uh, uh, there, over 8,000 Jew, Italian Jews were uh, murdered, and only a few hundreds returned, among them Primo Levi, who was able to write his uh, memoirs and uh, beautiful novels about this uh, terrible experience. Um, in the meantime, the Italian authority had seized uh, uh, in the cities the Jewish property, had uh, other Italians had occupied uh, uh, Jewish uh, houses or apartments. Uh, yeah, I wanted and... to, sorry to interrupt, I wanted to go a little bit over, over the property and the property to the point it was left be, uh, behind. Before, before this period, so before 44, 43, 44, when it was, the expropriation was clear, the, uh, there were still like caps on, so maximums that uh, Jewish owners could own as regards property or money or number of employees. And then, um, so what I wanted to know is where did that extra go? And then when the people were um, extradited completely, so they were deported to the camps, what happened with their property and what was the edge of Lee? Yes. Okay, uh, so uh, as 
as I men mentioned earlier, and as you were saying, uh, the, already the anti-Semitic laws of 1938 included uh, uh, the control on Jewish property and the limitation of uh, Jewish economic uh, or professional activities. Uh, uh, Jewish lawyers could all, uh, only had a separate uh, bar and could only have Jewish clients. Uh, the same is true for medical doctors and the Jewish firms that were reduced in size uh, and you could only have uh, uh, Jewish employees uh, if you were Jewish. Um, so the EJELI was created, with, which was a basically a, an institute uh, uh, that would hold uh, uh, Jewish uh, property in the hands of uh, the Italian authorities. Uh, and um, only a few Jews were able to uh, escape or partly reduce the effects, the economic effects of the laws, and we're still speaking of 1938 and the immediately following years, if they obtain the so-called uh, discrimination, discriminazione, which was a, sort of an alleviation of the consequences of the laws, which was, uh, would be decided case by case by Italian authorities on the basis of a request by the individual or the family, which had to mention and document uh, patriotic merits of the individuals or the family. For example, having joined at an early stage the fascist party, having fought in the First World War, etc. And if you obtain this alleviation, uh, which meant they got some of their money back uh, or were able to obtain uh, officially a radio, because uh, among the uh, terrible uh, uh, consequences of the laws uh, in, in a sort of escalation which uh, uh, was meant to depress and demoralize socially uh, Italian Jews, uh, you also had among the measures uh, the confiscation of the radio, which at the time was the major media uh, for information. It's as if uh, uh, they did not allow you today to have a, an iPhone a, or a you know a cell phone or, or shut down your internet, so to speak, uh, because uh, uh, so some obtained the radio back, for example, and this was the. Uh, but, but if you uh, if you if you got the discrimination, yeah, so you were allowed to keep some of your properties. You were anyway shut down from most of your public life, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, it was, as I said, it was a, uh, a system of, uh, of apartheid. It was a separate uh, sort of Jewish world in which uh, self-secluded, not physically, but uh, socially and uh, economically. Uh, and what is important is to understand that this was the new face of Italian society as fascism had envisioned it at the end of the 30s. We usually think of it uh, as a premise to the war and a, a sort of a, in a later phase of fascism and uh, wrongly, some say fascism was all right until 1938, uh, but actually uh, from the fall of 1938, uh, fascism, which is Italian society, thought, it, thought of itself as anti-Semitic based on racism. And in the uh, worldview of fascism, that would have been the state and the situation of Italian society uh, for, the, for, the for an unpredictable future. Meaning from now on, Italy will be uh, you know, free of Jews. Uh, this is the new, uh, the new uh, Italian man uh, is uh, racist, anti-Semitic, and is certainly uh, Jewish, uh, Jew-free in a sense. Um, so we should think that this, is, this was a new phase of fascism, a new phase of Italian society. Later came the war in which the situation even worsened, uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, even if we uh, only had the, the initial phase, which has been called the phase of the persecution of the rights of the Jews, uh, the rights of citizenship, uh, their social rights, their economic rights, uh, we would have had a, a, you know, a, a pretty bad moment. A pretty anyway. bad situation and a situation in which uh, Italy had, uh, would be based and was based and had, had become officially racist and anti-Semitic and would be that in, in, the, for, in the foreseeable future. Things worsened so, later with the war. 
So about the property, it said that there, there was about probably around 20, $200 million of property that was taken. Um, what, what were the kinds of property that was taken? Houses. Um, you mean you mean during the Holocaust, during the war? Well, uh, during the war, 45 in Italy? yeah, in in forty three, forty five, during the war, uh, at that point, uh, uh, the fascism had moved from the persecution of the rights of Jews to the persecution of the life of Jews. So Jews would have be gone, and their properties would have been entirely. Uh, you know, encamerated by uh, and taken, confiscated by the Italian state, uh, both uh, the the banking account, the the banking accounts, uh, their their apartments, and we have documents in uh, in the Italian state archives which show Italian police entering uh, the houses of all Italian Jews, uh, whether they were arrested, had been arrested, or had fled. Uh, in hiding or uh, were able to escape abroad uh, and uh, you find the very detailed enumeration of all the property including cl clothing uh, objects and these are very chilling lists of jewish property uh, which uh, were taken uh, by the italian police in some cases uh, used sometimes there was embezzlement by the police itself by the local prefetti which were the head of pu the public order uh, in the Italian, in every province, in every major city. Um, in other cases, there were neighbors uh, or former employees who uh, took control of, of these properties, sometimes after the Italian authorities had drafted the inventories of these properties. Um, and some and most of this was then returned after the war, not in the cases of those who had been killed uh, and had left no heir, uh, heirs. Uh, uh, and in some cases, uh, the return of this wealth was extremely slow, complicated by bureaucracy. And there were cases which I cite in the book, uh, paradoxical and even absurd, in which uh, not only there was a strong uh, delay, a, a big delay in the return of the wealth, but even but this wealth was even uh, ta uh, taxated or taxed uh, afterwards, uh, because uh, the, the, the the Jewish citizen was asked uh, to pay the Italian state uh, uh, some form of interest because it had, uh, sort of, so to speak, the, uh, uh, held the, the, the management wealth in hands and had, had managed this wealth. So, so going a little bit back, so what happened is they had this list. Were the list as orderly as the Germans? Because the Germans actually. Um, many, many of the Germans fell in Nuremberg because they had such good records of their own deeds that um, there, there is a saying in Spanish that is the fish dies by the mouth. And that's actually what happened. They had such good lists of their own takings and their own murders that it was, I don't know if easy, but it was getting the evidence for Nuremberg was there. Were the Italians as there are, effective? There is full evidence of all, of, uh, of the uh, actions of, uh, of Italians uh, against the Jews in every state archive in every Italian province. There are uh, dossiers on every single Italian Jew of every age. Uh, the point is, and the fact is, and we can go uh, into that later, that there was never an Italian Nuremberg. <laughs> uh, there were post-war trials, uh, but the uh, anti-Jewish activity was uh, uh, not really taken into account uh, in these trials, uh, and most fascists uh, uh, actually escaped uh, uh, any punishment, uh, not only for their anti-Semitic activity, but in general for their participation in the dictatorship uh, because of uh, amnesties, uh, uh, which uh, really ended any punishment uh, uh, of the of fascists responsible for all this action by the uh, early 50s uh, in Italy. This, this is a part I, I really, I find really fascinated. What happened afterwards? Right. So we get to 45, April 45, everything's finished and that's when the movie ends and we have the flowers just popping out. 
but it wasn't such so easy and so perfect that the war ended and everything went perfect and we started again as if nothing had happened. How many people did all the did all the deported people came? One thing I think that we didn't say at the beginning is that we're not only speaking of Italian born Jews, there were also Jews who had fled from other European countries who uh, were a large part of the Jewish population of Italy at the time. Right. And they were actually the first ones to suffer from persecution, right? Right. Yes, there was a, a, a relevant group of uh, Central and Eastern European Jews who lived in Italian cities uh, had fled the uh, Nazism. Uh, because initially fascism was not anti-Semitic uh, before 38. So uh, while Nazism ha had been anti-Semitic since its uh, seizure of power uh, in 33, so there was a, a time lag which allowed uh, some, some Jews to escape to Italy uh, to uh, integrate, uh, at least in part, within Italian society. Uh, and some were uh, trapped in Italy during the war uh, they were uh, among the first arrested and moved to uh, transit camps. Uh, and there were large uh, foreign Jews, uh, or meaning non Italian Jews, for example, in, in Florence, uh, but not only, all in several Italian towns. Uh, and uh, some of them were deported. And, uh, uh, and uh, so the, Italy was not uh, a, any form of protection for, for them. Uh, but if we come to what happened after the war, uh, some Jews returned from the camps, uh, others uh, re-emerged from hiding, uh, either in the countryside or because they had reached uh, the Italian south where the Allies uh, had uh, uh, you know, uh, reached, uh, uh, had uh, landed and had started climbing uh, the, the peninsula, uh, liberating Naples, Rome, Florence, etc. Some had fled uh, to Switzerland uh, and were able to uh, hide and to be welcomed in a neutral country, although many others had, were rejected by uh, Switzerland or were uh, betrayed by those who had, they had paid, uh, thinking that they would be helped to be, they, they would be, they would receive help to move and to flee into Switzerland, but then were actually sold to Italian or German authorities. Uh, after the war, uh, there were some trials uh, uh, for the fascist crimes, uh, but this activity ended already in the summer of 46, uh, to summarize, uh, with the uh, general amnesty enforced by Togliatti, who was uh, uh, the Palmiro Togliatti, who was the leader of the Communist Party, and at the time, the, the, the Minister of Justice uh, of, in the Italian government, who decided that there, were, there was the need for a reconciliation of Italians. Uh, and we're speaking here of the general responsibility of the uh, participation in fascism, not only and not really about the anti-Semitic persecution, which at the time was not even considered uh, a specific uh, or, or formally defined crime uh, that's true also for Nuremberg, where you only spoke, where they only spoke of crimes against humanity. Crimes against the Jewish people was a, a later uh, juridical uh, um, accusation, uh, legal accusation uh, uh, that was uh, um, used, for example, uh, with the Eichmann trial, and also was actually an Israeli innovation, so to speak. Um, so um, the trials that had happened really had no major consequence. Uh, those who had been jailed were mostly released. Uh, the anti-Jewish persecution had not been this object of treatment and almost never emerges in the uh, juridical uh, and in the trials and the proceedings of the trials of the time for which we have plenty of documentation. It's not, it's not even mentioned usually um, because it's seen as part of the war and because it's uh, considered uh, the dirty job done by the Germans, uh, and this was not the case. And also, you have to think that uh, the, poli the police forces, uh, who had been part of the Salo Republic, uh, uh, are the armed, uh, an armed uh, corps uh, uh, of the uh, Italian state, remained in, in power, remained, remained untouched. There was a very strong continuity of Italian police, uh, of Italian uh, um, the 
juridical, uh, uh, the legal power, meaning uh, uh, judges, prosecutors, uh, most of them remained uh, in their offices. Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to get to. So there was kind of a revolving door. It was the same people before as after. So right. they signed their own amnesties. They... In a sense, in a sense. And uh, for example, I mentioned a case in Venice uh, where I live and teach uh, uh, where the, uh, po the police officer, who high police officer who was in, had been in charge of the uh, uh, confiscation of Jewish property was put in charge of the restitution of Jewish property after the war. <laughs> because of course he was the expert uh, uh, in the, quest the local questura and nobody knew better than him uh, the, what where he, things came from. And uh, his office had the, had the full details and he was responsible also of the restitution. Uh, and did, did, the, did the Jewish community have any say at that point? There, there were some legal actions, but very limited. And in general, one must say that the attitude of Italian Jews, as of Jews more generally, uh, was uh, to try to forget, uh, forgive, and leave uh, these events uh, behind. And this uh, would lead us to a broader uh, you know, topic, uh, which is the general question of how you know, uh, Italy, Europe, uh, and its Jewish communities wanted uh, and how much they wanted to remember what had happened in the immediate aftermath of the war and uh, the problem of tolerating the, the news, uh, the experiences, uh, and the desire to uh, move on and to start a new life, uh, which was uh, a general part of the uh, of the European experience after the war throughout throughout Europe, I would say. Uh, and this uh, is uh, well uh, represented by well no, known episodes, for example, the rejection of Primo Levi's uh, novel, If This Is a Man, which was not published by its uh, first intended publisher, Einaudi, uh, and was actually rejected. It has been discovered by another Jewish author, Natalia Ginsburg, who didn't want to publish it because she fought with others that Italian society wanted to sort of leave behind these, uh, uh, these memories. Uh, and Jews wanted to integrate again. So we have several statements in which they express uh, uh, gratitude to Italians, uh, uh, they express uh, gratitude, for example, the Vatican, and here we have uh, the question of uh, the role of the clergy in rescuing many Jews, uh, on one hand in Rome, but throughout Italy, uh, and on the other hand, the question, uh, the complicated question of the silences uh, of Pius XII, the major authority at the head of the Catholic Church. Uh, but there are statements by Italian Jews also in favor of Pius XII, public statements. Um, so the question of, of memory and the question of the uh, attitudes of the minorities uh, and of society at large is uh, a complicated one uh, which should be examined uh, carefully. Mm -hmm. um, and one more question, why is this point of view rarely discussed why is the is the is the good Italian better publicized than than the executioner? Sorry, I think it's a, this is an interesting question. But historians have uh, insisted and in a sense studied uh, in the last uh, say twenty years uh, the um, production of the so-called myth of the good Italian, the idea that the Italians were always. Uh, uh, good fellows, uh, uh, that in comparison to Hitler, Mussolini was a, uh, you know, a, an easy guy, although he had been... Well, actually, Nazi. taking a comparison, excuse me, taking Hitler as a parameter to compare, like, probably 99% of the people are nicer. So, I don't think well, it, it's that, a good that's expression. The point, uh, that's the point. The, uh, Mussolini had been a uh, Hitler master, but then the students, uh, Hitler had overcome the master, and... Uh, uh, for some reason, there is a hierarchy of uh, uh, evil that is established uh, in which uh, the crime of Italians uh, in the colony, including the use of gas in bombing uh, uh, Ethiopians in the mid-30s, the violence uh, in uh, uh, the occupation of uh, uh, Libya, which included uh, uh, camp, uh, concentration camps for uh, indigenous people uh, already in the mid-30s, uh, 
the violence in the Balkans uh, by the Italian army and um, anti-Semitism, including the deportation and confiscation of Jewish wealth, which led 8,000 Jews uh, to the, in, into the hands of Germans, uh, is not considered uh, uh, evil. What we insist on uh, is often and too often uh, the good, uh, the, the image of a benevolent Italian uh, bringing civilization in the colonies, uh, uh, saving Jews, uh, uh, and every year uh, there is the discovery of a new uh, writers, uh, of a new Italian who has rescued Jews during the war, and normally uh, this, Jew, this Italian has rescued the, the Jews in the hundreds or even in the thousands. Uh, while, uh, and this uh, actually prevails in the public discourse uh, of the uh, Journal della Memoria of the Holocaust Remembrance Day, while the role of the executioner is obscured. In the official Italian law uh, itself, which establishes the uh, Day of Remembrance, uh, drafted and enforced in 2000, over 20 years ago now, uh, the, uh, the rescuers are named explicitly, the uh, persecutioners are not named explicitly, meaning there is a, a neutral reference to persecution while the rescuers are named as an active subject. And one word especially is missing in the law, the word is fascism. There's no mention of fascism in, the, in that law, a short law. You can all see it if you look for it online. Uh, so my question is, what are Italians exactly asked to remember on January 27th if, they, if this is the day in which they should face their responsibilities, uh, not only during Second World War, but in general about the uh, era of totalitarianism uh, between the wars in Europe? Uh, unfortunately, Italy has given the world not only the Renaissance, uh, but also fascism. And the word fascism was born in Italy. Even the word that totalitarianism was born in Italy. This is often forgotten. Um, thank you, Simon. We have two questions so far. And if uh, people are interested in asking questions, they can pull them in the chat. Um, so, Giorgio, Ask, we know that there were many righteous Gentiles among the Italians, so the good Italians that we were talking about. Did the change from apartheid to the genocide later engender more um, of the good action? So as the, I guess the question would be, as the Italians started um, seeing the genocide, did that create more good Italians, or did it did it like um, well, how do you say that put uh, gas to the fire into anti-Semitism, making it grow? I think, there were, I think there were mixed reaction, but it's true that when the life of Jews was at stake, in many cases, uh, uh, Italians. Though I, I would not generalize, I don't think uh, it's very uh, relevant to speak of a national character. This is one of the problems with the uh, image and the myth of the good Italian, that there is a, a generalization which is based on, a, uh, on the supposed existence of a national character, the German, the Italian, the bad Italian, the bad German, um, or the bad Italian, or the bad German and the good Italian. Uh, I don't believe, and I think you cannot discuss historically of national characters, if not through stereotypes and a very broad generalization, which don't hold historically. Uh, when the Holocaust started in Italy, you saw both solidarity and, uh, and people uh, mostly not so much perhaps supporting the anti-Semitic uh, and genocidal turn, uh, but being and showing uh, indifference. Uh, after all, the, uh, the war had hit hard on all Italian and European society. So Italians were suffering under the bombs uh, of the allies actually. Uh, and uh, the war was war for everybody. And many thought that uh, there was no need to show a particular generosity towards Jews. Also, in many cases, uh, when there were rescuers, uh, uh, the rescue was paid for by, by Jews themselves. Of course, they needed uh, these people who hosted Jews needed help in feeding them, etc. But sometimes uh, it was a, a sort of a, a taxation or a rent paid by by Jews. In other cases, it was the generous welcoming 
of, uh, of families uh, in, in uh, convents uh, or in farms uh, or in the or in hiding in private apartments. Um, so let's, um, if we can move, there are different questions. There's one about Ritiera Sansama. Yeah, um, I can read the questions. It okay. Says, can you speak a little about the, well, you want to read it in English, so you have a better English. Yeah, if you can speak a little about Ritiera San Saba in Trieste, there's estimated 3,000 people killed there. It's the only um, cremation a place in Italy, actually. And he, he's, uh, George, uh, Carl is asking yeah. who were the majority of prisoners killed at this uh, concentration camp. Yes. I think well, actually Gabriele so, talked about it about two years ago, right? The Rigiera di San Saba uh, was a, a concentration and in part extermination camp uh, in Trieste. The city of Trieste was under direct German control uh, because the eastern part of Italy uh, was uh, directly occupied by Germans, which, do, which does not mean that there was no support by local Italian authorities. In fact, it was a, a very large police force and bureaucratic uh, uh, support by Italians also in Nazi-occupied Trieste because the, the Nazis could have not done without this help uh, locally. Um, the uh, Risiera was a former uh, rice factory, uh, a factory for the treatment of rice, which was turned into a prison and uh, 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 some hundreds of uh, prisoners uh, were even killed there. It is disputed whether there was not, it is disputed to this day whether there was not a crematorium there it's, uh, in place in the Rizier itself. Certainly there were Jews killed, Jews and also Slavs and some political prisoners killed there, uh, but most of them were there as in a, tra a transit camp and were then shipped to uh, uh, camps, uh, extermination camps, uh, in uh, especially Auschwitz, but not only in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, especially Eastern Europe, Poland. Um, uh, but this, in fact, was the only extermination camp, the Risiera in Trieste, running in, uh, in Italy. Uh, the others were uh, concentration and transit camps throughout Italy. The next, there's a question by Barbara that I think she sent it to me because she knows I am in, in, embedded in this topic, but it's a, it, it's a different angle to it. It says, were art collections included in the property restitutions? Some art collections, as far as I know, some uh, art collections were basically because the Hague Convention uh, made the, like, ordered the restitutions to happen. Uh, but in many cases, because there are those conventions, but you need to apply local law to comply with the, with the, um, with the conventions, what happened is there are elements, so originally when the people who had them were the ones that originally had taken or accepted it knowingly, knowing that it was either stolen property or property taken by force, then it was, they were restituted. What happens nowadays is that the one of the elements of the crime, you know, crimes have elements, have different little parts. It's like a necklace with different pearls. So if one of those elements is missing, then the there is there is no crime because they're not not all the pearls in the necklace are there. So if the people have them because they acquired them in good faith, because they inherited them and didn't have a clue, because all that kind of thing a case doesn't necessarily fall, but can very easily fall. Because there is, so this case is that I was reading about the case of Borbone Parma, about the restitution of, or the intent that there is an order of restitution. However, when they go to court to try to rescue that, the intent, so they have property that wasn't, that was taken by force, but they don't have, the, the owners today, don't have the requisite intent of having taken by force. They just inherited it from, I don't know, two, three generations. So it's probable that those cases fall these days. There is a new, or actually very recently, I think it was November or December, the United States and Italy have re-signed 
a previous agreement of restitution um, that had been on for ages and it's going on, but I don't know how much that goes. With the new laws in the United States, survivors can sue in United States courts because the law favors more the restitution because the, um, um, well, now I cannot find the, the word. Um, the statute of limitations in the United States for the restitution of works of art taken at the Holocaust is longer, basically. I don't know if that was the answer, but it's just to put a different angle to it. Simon, if you have uh, comments Well, I on see that. that there are numerous questions in the chat anyway, so on other topics. Okay. So um, where would you like to go next? Well, There's I see one... a question about the role of Pius XII and uh, sure. what does France, uh, Pope Francis say in defense of Pius XII? The, 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 the attitude, I mean, the question of Pius XII is the question of uh, the silences uh, of uh, Eugenio Pacelli, the Pope of the time, who had been also the Vatican's ambassador in uh, Germany during Nazism, had signed the agreement between the Catholic Church uh, and, uh, and Hitler, uh, he was then made Pope uh, in uh, 39. And uh, as the Holocaust happened, as they say, under his own windows, he did not uh, speak out uh, and speak up against the Germans uh, and the arrest of Jews uh, and in, in defense of Jews. Uh, today there is, a, for other reasons, a, a process of uh, beatification of Pius XII. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, the Italian Church defends uh, uh, obviously the role of the of the Pontifex uh, uh, of the time, uh, citing uh, diplomatic concerns, uh, uh, etc. Uh, one of the problems with the attitude of, of the Catholic Church was that it did not officially reject anti-Semitism until the not after the war, but uh, the early 60s. The, uh, uh, Second Vatican Council, uh, in which, uh, through the declaration Nostra Etate, uh, the Catholic Church began a process of rejection of antisemitism uh, and of, uh, in a sense, uh, self uh, exploration uh, about its responsibilities, not only during the Holocaust, but in the centuries old tradition of uh, uh, anti Jewish uh, uh, feelings uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, doctrinal uh, 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 tradition and statements, uh, uh, a, a long path uh, which has uh, led many years later uh, uh, John Paul II to visit the synagogue in Rome, uh, to visit Israel, to acknowledge officially Israel as a Jewish state, uh, uh, a process which still continues uh, today in a sense. Um, the following okay. questions. Yeah, let, wow, there's a lot. Um, well, the role of partisans. Decide how, how late will we run, first of all, to have um, for 4.25, so we have uh, 12 minutes. Okay. Okay. Another um, 20 minutes. Yeah, so let, let's go kind of more specific. I mean, the, we can draw parallel, parallels with, with society today thousands, zillions, but let's go more more to the point. Uh, so do you think there was indifference? Well, as in all wars and in all uh, situation of persecution, uh, indifference is perhaps the first uh, uh, the first uh, reaction uh, uh, of the of the majority. There is a so called gray zone, a, an expression used also by Primo Levi. Uh, in which the majority, in a sense, uh, uh, takes uh, uh, no responsibility for what is happening, neither uh, condemns uh, nor really helps out the victim. And um, so I think, as I was saying, the Italian society was under conditions of war. So it also was, in a sense, uh, being victimized by the war. And of course, we can discuss uh, the fact that uh, it had supported the uh, uh, for 20 years fascism. Fascism had preached the war for 20 years and suddenly the war came and uh, nobody wanted the war, especially so, because fascism showed to, be, uh, showed to be unprepared for the war and showed how the, the war had been more of a myth and a rhetoric than anything they were really prepared for. 
So going back to fascism, do you think fascism, why, why was it interest in, in, in pointing at the Jews as the bad guys? So going a little bit to Paul's question. Um, uh, it's a complicated question, but uh, certainly what counted was a centuries old tradition of antisemitism uh, within Italian society, especially anti-Judaism because of its Catholic uh, roots and tradition which again, the church rejected only in the 1960s. Um, the Jew had been uh, for centuries, uh, not only in Italy, but in Europe more generally, the so-called so uh, uh, foreign element uh, the, uh, or internal and uh, eternal foreigner, etern internal stranger, meaning the majority the small religious, excuse me, the small religious minority, which had never accepted, you know, well, Christianity, Catholicism, or Protestantism, depending where they lived. Uh, so there was a centuries old tradition of persecution. Italy had created, uh, or the Italian peninsula had seen the birth of the ghettos uh, in the Renaissance, so where Jews were segregated. Uh, when uh, a, much later, uh, the fascist dictatorship was created, uh, as Anna Arendt has uh, said in The Origins of Totalitarianism, totalitarianism needs to function an internal enemy. Uh, for a long time, this internal enemy had been socialist, the socialist, the communist, uh, at some stage, uh, also because of the alliance with Germany, also uh, through a process of uh, imitation, emulation, competition with the German ally, uh, the racial question, which had developed also in conjunction with the invasion of Ethiopia in 35, and in fact, the enforcement of the first racial law ever in 1937 in Ethiopia, which forbid uh, the mixture and the, of, uh, the creation of uh, uh, indigenous and Italian couples, uh, which preceded uh, the anti-Semitic law, all this brought to uh, racism, anti-Semitism, becoming a, a central aspect of the new shape which fascism took uh, at the ideological and also practical and political level in terms of policies uh, in the late 30s. Uh, so here we have some um, also questions about, so Gabriele gives some background or, or on, on the different, the three stages, 38, um, 338, 38 to 39, then 43, for 43, 45. Um, and then there's another question about the ideology. And I think that you answered now. Um, and then there's another question about awareness. How aware were those who contributed to the deportations that they were actually contributing to them? This is a, an important question, which I am often asked. Uh, there was some awareness uh, of what was happening in Central and Eastern Europe, in Italy. We have uh, uh, proof of this in diaries of the time, uh, in correspondence. Uh, let's not forget that the Italian army had fought with the Germans in uh, Russia in Operation Barbarossa uh, uh, since uh, until uh, uh, the fall of 43. So Italians were uh, allies and next to the Germans who were uh, accomplishing the final solution in Eastern Europe, killing thousands of Jews uh, in the in open field, in the killing fields of Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, under Italian eyes. Uh, so when they came back, they could tell stories. Uh, and then there were news which came through the church, the clergy and the international uh, Catholic networks, for example, uh, and also some news published in, international, in the international press uh, outside Italy, were in the three countries, in England and especially in the US. So news that circulated at the diplomatic level. Uh, what certainly uh, uh, most even bureaucrats and uh, in any case Italian participants in the process of arrest and persecution were aware of is that they were participating in a process of persecution. They knew that when they were drafting a list of Jews uh, to be arrested or even just a list of confiscated property, property, they were acting as persecutor in a uh, chain of destruction 
uh, which uh, perhaps they didn't know in detail would end with uh, death, but certainly they were aware of a process of general persecution, uh, which after all had started five years earlier in 38, as we said, and uh, was done uh, you know, under uh, the light of the sun, so to speak, <coughs> in open, uh, I mean, under everybody's, uh, nice. was not officially, publicly, uh, kicking out Jews of Italian society. And uh, this process of ghettoization had started five years earlier. <coughs> so the problem is that uh, this machinery of destruction had the need to function to sort of break up uh, several um, segments of the process, uh, which in a sense uh, de-responsibilized, uh, made every single person participating in an individual segment less responsible than clearly those who were at the end of the chain who were doing the killing, uh, but uh, still responsible for some part. And in fact, if those who drove the truck or ran the trains of the deportation uh, in Italy and in Europe had uh, raised their arms and sort of stopped the trains and all refused to uh, run the trains, they would probably be substituted, but in a sort of chain reaction, certainly there would have been uh, specific failures to the process. So the, the Holocaust could be put in place in general, not only in Europe, because there was not only in Italy, because there was this very large participation and the segmentation of functions which made things, in a sense, easier. There were only perhaps several thousands who did and performed, you know, bloody actions in the camps themselves, in the death camps, as pushing Jews in the gas chambers or uh, even, uh, you know, uh, yeah. downloading, uh, uh, loading the chambers with gas uh, or shooting uh, Jews uh, in uh, the open uh, killing fields of Eastern Europe. Uh, thousands of others participated to small and independent segments of those procedures, but these were all necessary cogs in the machinery uh, of destruction. At the same time, this machinery and this uh, bureaucratization uh, made people less responsible okay. for the killing and uh, made, in a sense, uh, um, participation quote unquote easier for a, a much larger number of people and de dehumanize the victims probably i want to thank you simon it's been such an honor and such a pleasure and thank you so much uh for participating and i'm i'm um uh, letting leah adelphi the president of Dante michigan close this session Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Simon. It was really, really, really very interesting and a pleasure. And I'm so glad that you um, accepted to talk to us today and I hope we can count on you in the future. Well, That's thank you so much for uh, having me. And uh, it was a pleasure and honor to be with you. Thanks for your interest in my work. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, next time I actually hope I'll be able to come to Detroit because it would be more fun for me and perhaps for you. Uh, and um, but for now, it's been a pleasure to talk to you from Venice, uh, and uh, perhaps I'll meet you over here uh, or over there. We'll see. And thanks for uh, this uh, great opportunity. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. Of course, we hope you to see uh, in uh, Detroit, hopefully, because we can travel, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Bettina Schlossberg organizing this beautiful um, uh, lecture with Pro Professor Simon Levi-Sulam. And uh, if you go to our link, you can certainly see uh, his work and the many books he 